respected viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of Life from Karbala with me, your host Ahmed Ali. Uh, tonight, inshallah, we will continue our discussion, uh, which we have been discussing over the past few nights, uh, the topic of human rights in comparison between the justice and genuine respect of Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, and the declaration of the rights of man and the citizens of 1789. Uh, over the past night, and especially yesterday, we examined the sayings of Imam Muneen, peace be upon him, uh, and compare those sayings with a declaration. As a matter of fact, yesterday uh, we examined the equity of Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, as well as the liberty and freedom um, that he allowed for the Muslims under his rule, and compared that as well with the declaration. However, tonight we are going to examine and compare between the sixth, seventh, and eighth, and ninth uh, article of declaration and the fourteen hundred-year-old sayings of Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him. Uh, but before we commence further in, into the show and to the episode, let's welcome our very special guest uh, who has joined us over the past few nights, Sayyid Mudaffar al-Qazwini. Habib Sayyidna, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu How are you? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah Sayyidna. Uh, Sayyidna, uh, uh, I, as well as the respected viewers, enjoyed uh, the discussion around uh, the knowledge and wisdom of Ali ibn Abi Talib um, from the first and second episode. If you can elaborate more on the knowledge of Ali ibn Abi Talib, it would be great. Um, when it comes to the knowledge of uh, Amir al muminin Ali Afdal al-Salati was salam, I could give you a reference from the book of Ibn Hajar. Mm -hmm. Ibn Hajar, a well-known uh, scholar from the Sunni madhab, mm -hmm. In his book, uh, Lisan al Mizan, the tongue of uh, the scale, it's translated to, but the book in Arabic, it's called Lisan al Mizan. The second volume of his book, he gives us a hadith. And that hadith is about the knowledge of Amir al Mu'mineen, alayhi afdal al salati wa salam. He says, Ibn Abbas, the cousin of, of uh, Rasulullah and Amir al Mu'mineen alayhum as salam gives us this tradition that he overheard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi say, Ana Madinatul ilm wa aliyun babuha. So the knowledge of Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi as salam is directly from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and the knowledge of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus, uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdal salati wa salam can give us these pearls uh, and uh, the eloquent uh, talks that he gave to his subjects, to his workers, and to the Muslims. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its gate. The book of Ibn Hajar, Lisan al-Mizan, volume 2. So this is a hadith that uh, we can share and elaborate when it comes to the knowledge of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdal salati wa salam. Before we enter our discussion. Inshallah. Uh, as I mentioned Sayyidina, tonight inshallah uh, our discussion will revolve around uh, the 6th, 7th, 8th and ninth article of inshallah. the declaration. Inshallah. The 6th article states that the law is the expression of the general will. All the citizens have the right to contribute personally through their representatives to its formation. All the citizens being equal in, the, in its eyes are equally uh, admissible uh, to all public dignities uh, places and employments according to their capacity and without distinction other than that of their virtues and of their talents. Uh, this, uh, this segment or article of the declaration is very significant when we examine it as well as when we examine the sayings of Ibn Abi Talib 1200 years prior to this. Of course. Uh, when, sorry, uh, you were saying. Especially say? when uh, we look at the letter between him and Malik al-Ashtar. Definitely, yeah. Uh, 
أمير المؤمنين عليه أفضل الصلاة والسلام gives Malik al Ashtar peace be upon him instructions how to choose his his party mm -hmm. or the members of his government. Mm -hmm. It's not based on ethnicity or race or uh, what social class they come from. Amir al Mu'minin alayhi wa salatu wa salam tells Malik al Ashtar, thumma akhtar lil huk bayna al nas afdal ra'iyataka fi nafsik. Choose for your governance and positions in your government from the people. Afdal ra'iyatik. Those who are considered to be the best in society. In which you, Malik, see them to be the best, most pious when it comes to the people of, of, uh, of, of Egypt and your citizens. So it's not based upon whether you're related to them or you're friends with them. Mm -hmm. No, it's based on who's the best out of the Muslims mm -hmm. or your citizens. Who has the ability to, who has the ability to conduct who has the ability to rule justly and rightfully Definitely. amongst the Muslims. And then, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdal salatu wa salam also says to Malik al-Ashtar, peace be upon him, to uh, how to choose his soldiers and how to choose his military commanders. Because it's such a crucial position. Definitely. As we saw in Iraq, the entrance of ISIS was given to them by the leaving of the post of military commanders in Mosul. Definitely, yeah. It was betrayal. They be it was betrayal. It was a military commander who left his post with 50,000 soldiers from Mosul. And that's how basically they opened the doors to ISIS. Yeah. So Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdal salatu wa salam emphasizes on this. To choose your soldiers and commanders wisely. Not based on which family they come from or mm -hmm. which back, what, what's, what's their background. Mm -hmm. Their background should only, based, only be based upon piety. فَوَلِّ مِن جُنُودِكَ أَنصَحَهُمْ فِي نَفْسِكْ لِلَّهِ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِإِمَامِكِ Choose those who truly want the desires of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet and your Imam. If they are not living by the laws and commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet peace be upon him and the teachings of, of the Prophet peace be upon him and your Imam, which mm -hmm. is Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, then this person should not be even considered to rule over the Muslims. Definitely. If his uh, interests aren't the interests of Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet, peace be upon him, this per person should not even be chosen yeah. to rule or to be given such a post, such an important post. And also, Amir al-Mu'mineen tells him, وَأَنْقَاهُمْ جَيْبًا And the purest when it comes to his pocket. Yeah. Because a military commander can destroy a nation. Definitely. Can revolt against his commander, can lead his, 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 his people into destruction if this person is willing to be bribed. Definitely. If he's willing to take a bribe, if he's willing to be seduced by this dunya and its dinars, then this military commander is of no good to the Muslim society or any nation. Definitely. Or any nation. Doesn't ma matter whether they are Muslim or non Muslim. If a military commander is corrupt, then you see the destruction of a nation. Definitely. So the posts and occupations when it came to the government of Amir al Mu'mineen, alayhi afdal salatu wa salam, was based upon whether they could uphold this post in a, a religious manner. Mm -hmm. Because Islam 
gave laws for every single aspect of life. Definitely. And Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salatu was salam, and the Prophet of Islam gave the rulings and the teachings of how a ruler should be, how a military commander should be. So these were the criteria in the government of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And those were the laws and the words that we could compare to the sixth doctrine that compares to the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, which was uh, written in the 17th century, in yeah. the late 17th century. When we examine uh, the letter of Ali ibn Talib to Malik al Ashtar, uh, we see that. Uh, even in the time of Ali ibn Talib when he ruled, he gave the people the opportunity to even um, judge against him. There was yes. one time uh, when someone stole something uh, or took something that belonged to Ali ibn Talib and when Imam Ali asked him for it, he said, no, this is mine. And he took Imam Ali ibn Talib to court. And this, is, this is not just at the government of, of, of Amir al-Mu'mineen, but this is the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. and Amir al-Mu'mineen walked the footsteps of, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. When Rasulullah became ill, the last sermon he gave amongst the Muslims, at the end of the sermon he told the Muslims, if there is anyone who has something against me, come forward. Mm -hmm. A Jewish man stood up and he told the Prophet, when you first came to Medina, you were riding your camel, your cane hit me in my stomach and it bruised my stomach. So I want to do the same thing to you as yeah. this is the only way of justice if you yeah. claim to be just. You hit me, I get to hit you back. You harmed me, I get to harm you back. And at the time the Muslims became very angry. Yeah. How does this man dare speak to the Prophet? Yeah. The Prophet is ill, these are his last moments and this man is is wanting to uh, to seek revenge from the Prophet, let's say. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, yes, where did I hit you? The man says, you hit me in my stomach. So he says, the Prophet tells him, come forward. The man comes forward. Rasulullah gives him his cane and removes his shirt and reveals his stomach. This man ends up kissing the stomach of Rasulullah yeah. sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and says, A'udhu billah min nar jahannam. Yeah. I, I ask refuge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the stomach of Rasulullah from the fires of jahannam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi prays for this man. Definitely. And this man ends up learning from Rasulullah what true mercy is, what true leadership is, and takes the shahada of Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I mean, when we, when we hear of such teachings of Rasulullah and such narrations, um, we, we, we can't be surprised that Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, would walk on the footsteps of his, uh, of his of cousin. Of his mentor. Amir al-Mu'mineen opened his eyes in the eyes of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi yeah. wa alayhi. The first person he saw after his mother gave birth in the Kaaba was Rasulullah sallallahu yeah. alayhi wa alayhi. He was two days old. And from two days old to the time of departure of Rasulullah, Amir al Mu'mineen would spend every single moment that he could with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Even when he was a young boy, six years old, who took him into his home? Yeah. Was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi when they came to Abu Talib alayhi salam because he was a poor man and they asked to, to raise one of the children of Abu Talib. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi took Amir al Mu'mineen into his home. Amir al Mu'mineen lived in the home of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Khadija alayhi salam. That's where he grew up. I mean. Amir al Mu'mineen has a saying, he says, I used to follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi like a baby camel that follows his mother. Every footstep that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi used to take, I used to step in that same footstep. So, and this was the reason why they truly fought Amir al Mu'mineen. Yeah. And why Amir al Mu'mineen was not given the privilege 
to his 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 divinely chosen position of khilafa mm -hmm. and leadership after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi. Because when he was asked, how will you rule? He said, I would rule upon the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet. And inshallah, I will illustrate this segment to you later on into the, into the show. Inshallah. Uh, moving on to the seventh uh, article, uh, which states, no man can be accused, arrested, nor detained, but in the cases determined by the law and according to the forms which it has been described. Those who dispatch, carry out, or cause to be carried out uh, arbitrary orders must be punished, but any citizen called or seized under the terms of the law must obey at once. I mean, we see this um, with the story that uh, I just mentioned about the person who accused Abdul Ibn Talib of taking something with him. Uh, he allowed himself, I mean, I mean, the ruler of the Muslim world to go to court, to go to court and sit in court as and you know, a defendant yeah. or, and when the, or the to judge, be prosecuted. When the judge asked uh, Amir Mu'mineen, he told him, Ya Abul Hassan, uh, and when you want to respect someone, you call him by his, you don't call him by his name, you call him by his, his kunya. by his kunya, his, his son's name. Um, so, and he addressed the person uh, accused of Talib by his first name. I mean, when he did not allow that, he told the judge, no, when you address him... Uh, you either address him like me or... or address me like him. Uh, like, Ya Ali or Ya Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know, and uh, at the end, the judge told Ali ibn Abi Talib, do you have anything to prove that this is yours? I mean, the commander of faithful, the ruler of the Muslim world is He's sitting in court. And the Khalifa is sitting in court and asked for evidence. And you know we don't see this with the, with with the rest of the of, of the, uh, the we don't want to say caliphs or khalafa or, or any uh, ruler that uh, ruled before or after upon man. Yeah, definitely. But Sayyidina, I mean, if you can mention a few uh, sayings and quotes about this. Inshallah, Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi wa salatu wa salam says, لا أخذ على التهمة ولا أعاقب على الظن. He says, I don't take. Uh, a person or prosecute a person based on someone's accusations mm -hmm. you know every day if uh, especially you're a judge there will always be accusations upon people mm -hmm. and most of the time they're found innocent how many times do we see in uh, American courts where there were people who were imprisoned for 30 years and then after 30 years they were left or their sentence was over after 30 years they found out this person is innocent and they were given their freedom mm -hmm. based on accusations yeah. and not just uh, this is to illustrate you know because today we live in uh, in an era where you know american news british news australian news russian news is all over you know, you could uh, see it from your telephones, you could see it from your laptops. So we know what's going on around the world. Mm -hmm. Even though I think America has, you know, the best laws out of <laughs> all the nations around the world, definitely much better than the laws that are in Bahrain or mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia or Qatar or, or these countries that are run by Muslims. As of yesterday, in the city of New York, they actually accepted the Muslim holidays as, 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 as a national holiday. The Eid of Fitr and Eid al-Adha. And honestly, this is democracy or it is some type of freedom. Uh, and of, of course, if, if there is an infallible He's not ruling. There were, there were, there will be injustice. But there is a big difference between, you know, a country like Bahrain, with which majority of, of its population are Shia Muslims, yeah. and the rights have been neglected and yeah. taken away from them for the past several years. And every day there is protests and people dying and yeah. arrested just because of their belief. Yeah. And these countries. Uh, you know, declare that they are Muslims. But this is nothing of Islam. Far, away from Islam. far away from Islam. You know, 
there's a saying that uh, you see Islam in the West practiced in the West by non-Muslims then you see it practiced by the Muslims yeah, in the Middle East. I mean you see that you know even when we uh, when we treat the animals you know uh, here you know in, in Muslim worlds animals have no right. Yeah. But well, I mean, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi would, uh, he, he wanted to make wudu one day and a cat came and started drinking from the water. Mm -hmm. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi let the cat drink. He let the cat drink until it was full. Then he made wudu from that same water. SubhanAllah. I mean, do we carry out that? Do, we, do, we, do, do Muslims carry out these traditions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi we, we say insha'Allah, I mean, uh, we hope that, you know, we can learn from them. So Amir al-Mu'mineen says, لا أخذ على التهمة I don't take, uh, uh, I don't imprison people, I don't punish people based on accusations. ولا أعاقب على الظن And I don't punish based on assumptions. Just because someone assumed that this person had committed adultery or drank mm -hmm. and we see this amongst the Muslims they see a person coming out of a store that sells liquor and the next day throughout the whole community Fulan is an alcoholic maybe he needed to buy some you know hot Cheetos or something oh. He, he needed to buy yeah. gum, bubble gum <laughs> how do you know? But this maybe he happened. wanted to buy a bottle of water water but this actually happened uh, one time uh, a person walked into an alcohol store not knowing it was an alcohol store you know in america and and canada the and, and the uk yeah. i mean it most stores sell, sell liquor yeah but they sell everything else as yeah. well so he wanted to use the phone and someone from the community passed by the same and street saw and saw him the next day everyone was talking about him similar to the uh, example you brought yeah. and this actually happened but uh, in the world that we live right now, I mean, uh, when we read this declaration, we see that uh, we, you, c you can't accuse someone, but uh, propaganda and accusations play a, a huge role in the demolishment of, of nations. Uh, but yeah, I mean... Th the of course, phones are tapped, you know, <coughs> your internet cookies are, are all, uh, you know, watched over. Yeah. You know, everything. Before you've even committed a crime, there is people watching you. The yeah. government's already watching you. <coughs> but in Amir al muminins government, you're not found guilty unless you commit a crime. No one has the right to come and butt into your business mm -hmm. or into your life unless you are found guilty. Mm -hmm. Then Amir al muminin has another word. Of course, you know, the seventh segment, the eighth and the ninth, they're very similar. Yeah, very similar. Very similar. So uh, if we could read them and then start explaining more Inshallah. in detail through the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen uh, alayhi the, uh, the eighth article states that the law should establish only penalties that are strictly and evidently necessary and no one can be punished but under the law established uh, before the offense and legally applied. Uh, similar to the ninth article which states any man being uh, presumed innocent until he is declared. Uh, he is declared uh, uh, guilty. Or guilty. Found sorry, guilty. Found guilty. Um, this is very significant when, when we compare the two and compare it to uh, the quote you just mentioned about Ali ibn Abi Talib. Someone has to. You have to find him in the action. You know, uh, for example, robbery or murder, or there has to be. Yesterday we mentioned that there has to be four witnesses. Um, to the crime and witnesses not any normal witnesses yeah, you know they, if you bring four pious. criminals yeah that uh, want to say they're witnesses Islam does not accept their yeah, or bribe. their witness or bribed yeah they have to be uh, just people you know mm -hmm. they they're known not to lie they're known to be truthful or mm -hmm. else the uh, the the court cannot take them as witnesses definitely I mean uh, the, the quote you just mentioned as well I mean, how many times do we see people get arrested for something they haven't done or, you know, just being accused for something? Uh, and Ibn Abi Talib stated that, what, 1400 years ago, that you can accuse someone of something? And you see something. how eloquent his words are. Definitely. If you see the laws that you've read, they're at least like three sentences long. Mm -hmm. Amir al muminin describes it in one sentence. Yeah. Five words. Five words. 
Which one is more powerful? Definitely. Which one holds more value? Amir al Mu'minin alayhi wa sallam salati wa salam says, La yajuz al qasas qabla al jinayah. You can't punish someone before he has committed a crime. He tells all his workers and gover- governors, governors around his, 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 his empire. Mm-hmm. Amir al Mu'mineen ruled over a very large amount of space of land. Mm-hmm. You know, what's equivalent to over 30 countries today. And he had workers that worked for him and governed for him over these countries or states within the Muslim Ummah. Mm-hmm. He writes to all of them. He, te- he tells them, لا يجوز القصاص قبل الجناية. You can't punish someone before he has committed a crime or he is found guilty. Mm-hmm. And he's only found guilty if there are witnesses involved. There are four witnesses involved. Very similar to the seventh and eighth and ninth yeah. doctrine. They're very similar together. And of, the f- uh, of the f- French Bill of Rights. Mm-hmm. And another saying of his, he says, man la hujjata lakum Leave the person who you have no proof over. Mm-hmm. You don't have proof that he was a thief or, 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 or a murderer or a person who, who, who uh, conducted a sin or a crime. You don't have proof over him. Then you have to let him free. You can't hold him. Sometimes we see today, they still put you in a cell until you further notice. Yeah. You Sometimes know. you spend, you know, days in a jail cell until, you know, you get a lawyer, uh, you know, until you're proven innocent. In Imam Ali's government, every single human is, is innocent until found guilty. Do you see the opposite? Mm-hmm. Do you see where, 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 where the difference is? In Amir al muminins government and in Islamic law, every single human being is innocent until proven guilty. There is an instance where a man comes to uh, Amir al muminin alayhi wa salatu wa salam. Amir al muminin is, is saying this, this uh, occasion that occurred with him. He says, a man came to me. Mm-hmm. And this man told me that Abdullah bin Wahab was Zayd ibn Hasin, these two individuals in Kufa, they were sp- saying, uh, you know, threatening you. I overheard them saying such, a th- such things that if, if anyone had heard them, he had beheaded them or had taken them custody and placed them into a life, uh, life in prison sentence. So Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdala salati wa salam asks him, so what do you suggest? He says, I, I suggest that you summon them and you take off their heads. These people are a threat to you. He asks, Amir al-Mu'mineen asks him, have they done anything yet? He says, no, but I overheard them saying, so they are a threat. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdala salati wa salam turns to him and says, that I have figured that you are a person of no religion, no faith. No faith and religion and no aql, no brains either. You want me to punish individuals in my government before they commit a sin? Mm-hmm. Yes, they over, they, they, you, you overheard them speaking. They have the freedom to dislike me. Yeah. You know, I can't force everyone to love me. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi could not force everyone to love him. Jesus couldn't force everyone to love him. Moses, neither 124,000 prophets. Yeah. There were people that stood against them. Against Moses, against Jesus, against Muhammad. So Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi wa salati wa salam tells him, you want me to punish them? for them just carrying hatred towards me. Punishment will only occur when the crime occurs Mm -hmm. or when a crime occurs. 
And Amir al-Mu'mineen was so strict, so strict when it came to abiding by the laws and setting his laws. It didn't matter who it was. He was so precise. One day, there was a man who had committed a sin and Qambar was ordered to lash him. Let's say he was ordered to be lashed 90 lashes, 60 lashes. It depended on you know the ruling. Qambar mistakenly, mistakenly lashed him three extra lashes. Amir al-Mu'mineen was standing aside and he counts the lashes. He tells Qambar, Qambar, you lashed him three extra lashes. That's not of, of, of what was, you know, written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or placed by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi by Islamic law. So you didn't have the right to lash him these three extra lashes. So now by Islamic law and by the laws of the government of Ali ibn Abi Talib, you have to be this person owes you three lashes. You should have counted correctly. He gives the, the whip to the person who was lashed and he tells him you either forgive Qambar or you take your three lashes. Even a person who is so close to Amir al mumineen yeah, like Qambar, peace be upon him. He was in the house of, of Ali ibn He lived with him. He was the closest servant to Amir al mumineen But justice is justice. Yeah. Justice is justice. And, and justice as it goes for me, for me and you, or what for Qambar, it goes against us Definitely. and it goes against Qambar as well. Does it matter? Yesterday we All subjects are subjects in the government yeah. of, of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Definitely. All citizens are citizens in the government of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this is equality. Yeah. This is equality. If Amir al Mu'mineen Ali Hafdal al Salati was salam had said no because Qambar is my servant and I love Qambar, where is the equality? Yeah like other khulafa and rulers did in their era. And this is the difference between Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, and everyone else. This is the difference. That even a person who is close to him, it doesn't matter, justice is justice. Definitely. Amir al-Mu'mineen is in the Masjid of Kufa, mm -hmm. his last days. And everyone has heard the famous words of Amir al mumineen when he stood and addressed his citizens. Saluni qabla an Ask me before you, I am no longer with you and you lose me. Ask me anything that you wish, anything from the throne of Allah and below I have the answers for from where I am sitting. It said a very tall man stands up, very tall man, you know, with a big body. Have you seen the big show? Yeah. Someone like the big show. Yeah. He stands up and he tells Amir al Mu'mineen, alayhi afdal al salati wa salam, that. He raises his voice towards Amir al mumineen and says, Oh, the one who claims to know what he does not. Subhanallah. Respond to my questions. Yani even a child to his father, can he speak to him this way? Yeah. Let alone the leader of the Muslims. Or if this man wasn't a Muslim because he was not, he was... It was one of the Jews that lived inside the government of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But he's your ruler. Yeah. You should at least show him some respect. Those around Ali ibn Abi Talib rushed towards him. Yeah, they pulled out the swords. Amir al mumineen says, relax guys, relax, calm down. This is not the way 
of the representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hujajillah, the vicegerents of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the proofs and miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are not shown by punishment, by punches and kicks. No. The miracles and the proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are shown through mercy. And I show this man mercy. Let him ask his question. So this man starts to question Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi afdal salati wa salam. And Amir al Mu'mineen responds to every single one of his questions. But you see the different, you, you see how Amir al Mu'mineen ruled over his subjects. How he ruled over his subjects. Didn't matter if he's a Muslim or a Jew. Mm -hmm. They're equal when it comes to government. When it comes to governance. When it comes to governance, it doesn't matter if they're Muslim or Jew. As long as he's not breaking the laws of government, then he should be respected. Definitely. He should be respected. So, uh, this is what I can think of when it comes to the seventh and eighth document mm -hmm. or doctrine. Yeah. So, I, uh, if you could please recite the ninth one. We, I, I mentioned the ninth one. Um, Did you already mention yes, the ninth one? Yes, the law, uh, sorry. Any man being presumed innocent uh, until he is proven guilty. This law, I mean, we just we just mentioned that with Ali ibn Talib. Um, but going back to the story um, of uh, Ali ibn Talib being in court with that person, he was asked, um, Ali ibn Talib was asked, do you have any proof that this is yours? And the man swore by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that that's his. Ali ibn Talib says, if, if he has sworn and that's his, then I am no longer, uh, have no longer anything to say. And Ali ibn Talib left. I mean, the commander of faithful, um, you know, at the end he was, you know, not proven guilty, but the person um, lied in court, and Ali ibn Talib accepted that because he didn't have any witnesses. Because he didn't have any witnesses. When the man saw that of Ali ibn Talib, he rushed to him, and you know, just the justice of Ali ibn Talib. I mean, of course. He, he even uh, put the law on himself. And if, if the law is against him, he, he's going to take it. Because, as I said, he lived the life of, of Rasulullah sallallahu mm -hmm. alayhi wa alayhi. He, he, he lived by the commandments of Allah, subha uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdala salatu wa salam, when he was asked to take khilafah, his words were, وَرَدُّ الْحَقَّ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ وَاتَّبَعُوا سُنَّةِ نَبِيِّكُمْ If you want true leadership, bring it back to me and follow the, the, the sunnah, the tradition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And for them, this had no value. Mm -hmm. This had no value. This is why historians say when Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa uh, salamu alayhi, alayhi said this, they explained the atmosphere within the gathering. They say, فَتَغَامَزُوا بَيْنَهُمْ وَتَشَاوَرُوا They started winking to one another and whispering to one another. After Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdala salati was salam gave his sermon, after the death of Umar, <coughs> when the candidates were Uthman and Ali, why did the Khilafah go to, to Uthman? Because Amir al-Mu'mineen declined their proposal. And he gave them his proposal. He said, you either follow the tradition of Rasulullah and the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or else I don't want to lead you. So he says, they started winking to one another and started whispering to one another, saying, عَرَفْنَا فَضْلَهُ وَعَلِمْنَا أَنَّهُ أَحَقُّ النَّاسِ بِهَا We know that his value and that he, he, true, he is the person who deserves the Khilafah and the leadership after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi وَلَكِنَّهُ رَجُلٌ لَا يُفَضِّلْ أَحَدًا عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ But he's a man that, 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 that does not give opportunity to a man over another. He does not favor someone. He doesn't favor Ahmed over Sayyid Mudaffar or Sayyid Mudaffar over Ahmed because he is related to him. Mm -hmm. You see? فَإِنْ وَلَّيْتُمُوهَا 
إياه جعلكم وجميع الناس شرعا سواء So if you did place him as a Khalifa, he would count you the, the Bani Umayyah and you the Muhajireen and you the Ansar with the rest of the Muslims as equals. He wouldn't give the positions to the Muhajireen, those who migrated from, with Rasulullah from Mecca to Medina because they were the first to believe <coughs> or the Ansar because they paid allegiance to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in Medina <coughs> or based upon family members whether they were from Bani Hashim or not no all Muslims are, are equal walakin walluha uthman fa innahu yahwi yahwi alladhi tahwoon fa dafa'uha ilayh but give it to Uthman because he will give it to those who you wish to rule over you for those who you wish to govern and have power. And this is why they took the Khilafah from Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdala salatu was salam. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdala salatu was salam lived by the Qur'an. When the Qur'an states in the holy verse, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lata'arafu inna akramakum inda Allahi atqakum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you as tribes and nations for you to get to know one another. And the best of you and the greatest of you is those who have the most, the most piety. And this was the tradition and the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afwala salatu was salam. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi would say, لا فضل لعربي على عجمي إلا بالتقوى. An Arab is not greater than a non-Arab unless he's more pious, he's more religious than him. Or else, there's no reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us the same way. We come from the same father. Does it matter what he believes in? Mm -hmm. It's all based on piety. It's all based on how much you sacrifice for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the other hand, how did the other rulers, the other so-called khulafa rule over the Muslims. Sayyidina, uh, if, uh, if you can excuse me, we're coming to the conclusion. How many minutes do we have? Uh, we have two, I believe. Two minutes? Two minutes. Could we share one story and then come uh, to an end? Of course. At the time of Uthman, mm -hmm. Ibn Mas'ud, one mm -hmm. of the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, a very close companion to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, wrote a letter to uh, to Uthman. Mm -hmm. Actually, he wrote a, 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 a letter to Al Mughayra mm -hmm. that I mentioned the other day. And basically, he was saying he, that we, the Muslims, and the companions of Rasulullah, we don't accept this way of governance. So Al Mughayra writes to Uthman that Ibn Mas'ud is sp spreading th this propaganda against you. Days pass, Ibn Mas'ud goes to the masjid where Uthman is giving a sermon. As soon as Uthman sees Ibn Mas'ud, he orders his guards to, to, to grab Ibn Mas'ud and to take him out of the masjid. Uthman comes down from the pulpit, from the minbar. He leaves his, 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 his sermon. He orders him, his, his, his guards to severely beat him. Uthman also starts to kick Ibn Mas'ud in his stomach and his chest. To near death, a companion of Rasulullah. Does every Muslim not know Ibn Mas'ud? Ibn Mas'ud is beaten to near death. Why? Because he just did not agree with it way Uthman was ruling and his, 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 his people were ruling. Historians say that Uthman punished him for speaking out and for burial or of Abu Dhar. Abu Dhar was killed for the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Ibn Mas'ud buried Abu Dhar. He was whipped and lashed 40 times by Uthman for burying Another Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Is this a crime? I ask you by Allah, is this a crime? 
And this is not a normal man. He is the very close companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Both of them. One Ibn Mas'ud and one Abu Dhar. For us in Islamic law, even if a non-Muslim dies, we should bury him. Yeah. Let alone the closest, the closest of companions to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. This is a reason why they should be punished, why Muslims should be punished. They should be beaten to near death and persecuted and lashed. Subhanallah. This is the difference between Amir al-Mu'mineen and other Khulafa. I wish we had a couple more minutes so I could share another story. But if we are coming to a conclusion, if you then... Will, if you will, definitely. And the difference between... Uh, the, the justice of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdala salatu wassalam and the other uh, caliphs Amir al-Mu'mineen did not see a difference between your, your color yeah. you know this is not my opinion for me to be born brown Definitely. Allah created me brown it's not my choice to be born black Allah chose for me to be born black or for, for those who are black to be born black for you to be born other than Arab. But the time of Omar, those who were not Arab, they were persecuted in everything. Yeah. They didn't get the equal share. If you were a non Arab, you weren't allowed to marry an Arab. You weren't allowed to marry an Arab. You were not allowed to inherit. SubhanAllah. You were not allowed to inherit. Why? Aren't all Muslims given the, the privilege to inherit from their fathers as Muslims? One day he walks into the bazaar and he sees all entrepreneurs that held the bazaar of the Muslims majority were non-Arabs. He bans them, he bans them and he says non-Arabs are not allowed to sell buy and sell in, in, in our government unless they gain more knowledge in our religion. Why? Were these criterias placed upon the Arabs so they were placed upon the non-Arabs? I mean, they were ignorant before Rasulullah came. So, what was this, uh, you know, injustice? What was this, uh, where was the equality between yeah. man? When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Inna akramakum and Allahi atqaqum. And those who did not go by the laws of Umar, they were severely punished. If a non Arab married an Arab, he was punished. If they did inherit, they were punished. If they went to open a store to buy and sell without his permission, they were punished. Why? So called justice. According to them. And inshallah our viewers will hear from us inshallah. and go read books of history. Inshallah. To see whether we are saying the truth or not. Definitely. Whether the truth is where you think or where it's not. You know. The, the Prophet peace be upon him says justice is with Ali and Ali is with justice. SubhanAllah. I mean similar to that Imam Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi states um, he says Ali and ma al Quran wal Quran ma Ali I mean the, the Quran is with Ali and Ali is with the Quran. When we hear when we hear this um, you know wise words uh, we can only ponder and think about that um, whatever Ali Nabi Talib said was not, out the, of, the was not out of his desires or wishes. It's based on the Quran. It's based on the Quran. And uh, inshallah, we can continue inshallah our discussion we tomorrow. Wish our uh, viewers an early Eid Mubarak. Inshallah. inshallah. Today inshallah. is uh, Laylatul Jum'ah. We pray inshallah. for them by the shrine of uh, Sayyidul Shahada, the Master of the Martyrs. May Allah bless them and their families. Inshallah. And we ask all of you to keep us in your du'as and your prayers. May Allah bless you all. Thank you very much, Sayyidina. Inshallah. No, it's too early. It's but, too uh, early. Uh, it's okay. I get to shake your hand a little <laughs> bit early. Inshallah. <laughs> but thank you very much, Sayyidina. And thank you very much, respected viewers. Inshallah, as Sayyid mentioned, we will not forget you in our prayers. 
when we visit the Holy Shrine of Hussein and Abbas, peace be upon them, um, on a night like this, uh, the, the last night of Thursday in, in Ramadan, it's a very significant night uh, to do dua. Uh, so inshallah, uh, we can learn uh, from the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and especially Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him. So stay tuned for the next episode. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'll shake your hand once again. <laughs>